we're going to talk about the first recorded female sculptor in Spain. Her name was Luisa Ignacia Roldan, and she's often known uh, as La Roldana. She's the first female sculptor in Spain. She worked in wood and in clay. And some of her, sta her, her statues are these very, very large religious statues that are carved in wood. Uh, sometimes the draperies are carved and painted, as the figure that you see here. Uh, and sometimes she has a wooden head and hands and feet and uh, a kind of armature or shell uh, of metal or wood in which actual clothing is placed over it. And we're going to see both kinds. And these are life-size st statues. The other type of work that she's very famous for and very, very innovative are these very small terracotta figure groups. Now, terracotta means exactly what it sounds like. Terra is earth, cotta is baked, so it's baked earth. And we usually refer to terracotta um, in fairly low fire clay. Uh, very high fire might be porcelain uh, or stoneware, uh, depending on what type of clay. Uh, terracotta usually refers to earthenware, which is fired at around 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, which is low fire. <laughs> Um, the reason I know about that is because this is the kind of thing that I used to do, only not quite as accomplished as she did, I must admit. Um, she referred to these small uh, works as her jewels. And they are, they are um, you know, baked clay, uh, fired clay, uh, that has been polychromed. Polychrome just means many colors. They've been painted. Um, it's a new type of sculpture. It's very, very innovative. No one was doing anything like that at the time. Most of the sculpture would be architectural sculpture, or else we'll see um, sculpture that had to do with religious uh, uh, devotions, you know, statues in the church, things like this. Um, this was a whole new type of, of artwork. And uh, as you, you know, you've probably seen uh, porcelain groups from later times. Uh, uh, so it, it really does give rise to a whole new type of art. Her father was a wood carver of Seville. Uh, his name was Pedro. He had three daughters, he had two sons, and they all worked in the workshop. Uh, Luisa, who I think she was the third daughter, but anyway, she married Luis, so we have Luis and Luisa, Luis Antonio de los Arcos, who was a worker in her father's shop. Now, what's interesting, and we, we've heard this before with Lavinia Fontana, uh, we, hear it, uh, we hear it again with you know, certain uh, women artists, where the woman's skill um, is in the artwork is just better than the husband's. And so the husband becomes the assistant, and uh, Luisa becomes the support of the family. Uh, her husband uh, assists both by doing the polychroming, and when the children are old enough, they think that they may have do done this too. Um, and he also would take care of the business needs, uh, the accounting, uh, you know, legal uh, things uh, that had to be done. You know, keeping the accounts, things like that. Uh, 1686 to 88, they left Seville uh, for Cadiz, uh, where they, uh, where she was carving uh, life-size wooden angels and patriarchs. I don't have any pictures of those. I don't know if they've survived or not. Um, and then she uh, became the court sculptor. Uh, her title would really translate as the uh, sculptor of the chamber, and she would use this. She would put it on her artwork. Uh, because it was a really good advertisement, if nothing else, uh, because she was the court sculptor uh, from uh, 1692 to the end of her life for both the King Charles II and uh, his successor, uh, Philip V, these are the kings of Spain. Her salary was supposed to be 100 ducats a year, which is a nice salary. However, the problem was that there were hard times with the courts, um, as courts go, I guess, um, and they simply economize by not paying their bills, uh, which I guess kings can get away with, and so they would not pay her salary. And 
she was literally desperate. She had teenage children. Uh, she had uh, her husband, of course. She was she was the support of the family. Um, and the tragic thing is, because as you can see, she is a uh, most accomplished sculptor, was that she died impoverished. Uh, she was probably in her early 50s. Um, and it, it has been suggested that the trouble, uh, perhaps even malnutrition um, and uh, worry, uh, all of this may have contributed to her death. We have here a, a little statue. Uh, it's in uh, the Loyola University Art Museum. Uh, it's the Madonna and Child, Mary and the Baby Jesus, with the young St. John the Baptist. And this is actually signed and dated uh, 1692. One of these uh, polychrome terracotta statues uh, with the beautiful colors, uh, have lively draperies, uh, lively gestures as the uh, Christ child sort of kicks up one heel and the, uh, uh, the Baptist reaches for his cousin. Uh, you've got just really just beautiful, beautiful figures and very charming and tender. And you might notice that at Mary's feet, you have these little angel heads. These are little puti. Uh, puti are uh, little naked baby boys. Uh, if they are in a secular context, they're little loves little Eros figures. Uh, in a religious context, they become, we sometimes even call them cherubs, uh, but they become these little, uh, little baby angels. So that's the hint that this is not just any mother and child, she actually has angels supporting her. She has uh, a divine child. This is very beautiful, uh, very beautiful uh, terracotta group. Uh, which is the work that's probably re reproduced most often, uh, the death of Mary Magdalene. Uh, we don't have a, it's not dated. So the dates that people give are approximate. Uh, so let's say circa 1700, so we have 1697 uh, to 1701, so just uh, round it off to 1700. Uh, this and several other uh, works by uh, La Rolanda are in the New York Hispanic uh, Society of America. Now, I should explain a little bit about uh, Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, of course, is uh, a biblical figure. She's mentioned in the Gospel of St. John as the woman who first sees Christ after the resurrection. And she reaches out, and at first she doesn't recognize him. And uh, she thinks he's the gardener. Uh, presumably she's been weeping and can't see clearly. But uh, she says, uh, if you have taken away the body of my Lord, tell me where you have laid him. And Christ says to her, Mary, and she recognizes him, and she reaches out to touch him, and he says, touch me not, non le me tangre, touch me not, I have not yet ascended to the Father. So Mary Magdalene was obviously uh, someone who was very close to Christ. Uh, she was given uh, the privilege of being the first person to see him after the resurrection, uh, at least in the Bible. Um, and other, and so a whole story grew up about her. Uh, other women who are not named in the Bible, or even one who is named, uh, were associated with her. Mary of Bethany, uh, Bethany and Magdala are two different towns, but Mary of Bethany, uh, the sister of Lazarus and Martha, um, becomes identified with Mary Magdalene. Uh, the woman who was taken in adultery, there's no name given to her. She's identified with Mary Magdalene. Uh, the woman who at uh, the Feast of Simon uh, uh, washes Christ's feet with her tears and dries them with her hair, uh, that woman is, is identified as Mary Magdalene. And so this is, of course, during the Middle Ages, all these, not, not biblically. Um, but during the Middle Ages, uh, a whole story grows up that she becomes a prostitute, uh, the woman taken in adultery, uh, who is then converted to virtue by Christ and becomes one of his most devoted followers. Uh, she's a very popular saint. For one thing, she can show how a great sinner had become greatly favored by the Lord. Um, well... What happens after the resurrection and Christ's uh, ascension into heaven? Uh, the Bible doesn't say anything about Mary Magdalene. Uh, but people want to know. <laughs> uh, 
devout minds want to know. <laughs> and uh, a legend grew up that uh, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and a few other people were persecuted by being put on a boat without a sail and just sort of put out into the Mediterranean Sea where they were supposed to drown. But instead, the boat wafts its way over to Marseille, uh, to France. And so uh, Mary and her, and her companions um, end up in France, <laughs> according to the legend. Uh, but primarily what it is is Mary ends up in, uh, becomes a penitent saint. She goes out into the wilderness. She eats nothing every day. She is carried up to heaven by angels and fed on heavenly food. And there's um, many, many pictures, particularly in Germany and Poland, of uh, Mary, they call it the Ascension of Mary Magdalene, where the angels are carrying her up to heaven. Um, you see that uh, she has this uh, roughly textured garment. What has happened is her, um, her beautiful garments had uh, rotted away, and she is dressed in her own hair. And her hair, which once was, uh, uh, you know, something very seductive, now becomes a, a vehicle for modesty. Uh, the figures, of course, as you can see, are absolutely exquisite. They're beautifully uh, uh, graceful, delicate uh, figures uh, with very tender expressions and gestures. And, of course, you have two different kinds of angels, these sort of... Uh, young adult or adolescent uh, uh, angels, and then the, the little putti here, uh, the beautifully col colored wings. Um, you have an idea of the size. You know, it's uh, almost 18 inches long and about a little over 12 inches high. Now, when we look close to it, you see all sorts of little details on there. Um, let's see if you can see some of these things. There's an owl and a rabbit, and I think it's a hedgehog. I can't really tell in the reproduction, but I think it's a hedgehog. Uh, there's different flowers. These look like irises, which are known as the sword lily, um, often associated with sorrow, and uh, in the case of the Mary, the mother of Christ, the sword that pierces the virgin's heart. Um, we have little snakes and lizards. And then we have, you know, other things. All these things are little things that would be out in the wilderness. So they're telling you this isn't happening inside in some luxurious place. Uh, Mary Magdalene has been out in the wilderness for decades. And uh, uh, so we, we see the uh, little, what can I say? I want to say still life elements, uh, but are nature elements as well. And then... Uh, you can also see the attributes of a penitent saint. Uh, there is a skull, which is a line, so you're looking right up at the, um, the teeth, the lower jaw is missing, and uh, the book, which is presumably a Bible. Uh, the skull is so that she can contemplate uh, you know, the eternal fate of mankind, uh, uh, and uh, she can uh, do her penitence out in the wilderness uh, to make up for her sinful life. Uh, and she becomes, of course, a great saint. And there we see a little detail. And you can see here how the hair is growing down and becomes part of the dress. It's almost she's woven the dress out of her hair, uh, her living hair. Uh, and she's cradled by these beautiful angels. You notice that all of them have the mouth open, which is, you know, a little difficult to do. Uh, but it gives this expression, in her case, almost like she's, she's breathing her last breath. Uh, you know, are the angels singing to her? Are they talking to her? Are they comforting her in some way? Uh, now, um, some of these I don't have as good pictures. I've taken them from... Uh, some of them from the web and some of them from uh, other books, which was a black and white picture. Uh, these are two different views of the mystic marriage of St. Catherine, which is dated 1691, also in the uh, Hispanic Society of America, uh, in which you see uh, St. Catherine uh, is uh, marrying, is in a sense, uh, the Christ child. He's putting a ring on her finger. Uh, and this is to show, of course, her devotion to Christ. Um, and, it also sometimes ser and it also sometimes serves as a kind of example to nuns because they are the brides of Christ. Uh, we have uh, little angels playing, <laughs> dancing. <laughs> uh, 
and uh, surrounding the figures. Um, you can see at Catherine's feet this broken wheel, and that is her attribute. This is St. Catherine of Alexandria. Um, she had the vision, of course, of Christ, um, and she was supposedly this very wise woman, so she tries to convert the pagan philosophers um, and actually succeeds, and this makes the emperor, I think it's Diocletian, so angry that uh, he tries to have her torn apart on this wheel with spikes on it, but God doesn't want that to happen to her, so he breaks the wheel. And then they say the only way they can get rid of her is to cut off her head, and uh, of course that's what they do, and uh, so she is a uh, virgin martyred saint, and one of the most popular saints uh, for centuries and centuries and centuries. Uh, here's another one of these uh, small terracotta figures, the rest on the flight into Egypt. Uh, and you know, they're all very tender and, and beautiful and just exquisitely done. Now, one of the things that she also did were these very large-scale works of art. Remember, she was, her father was a wood carver, so uh, she learned to carve wood in her father's studio. Uh, and uh, here we have Saint Gines de la Jara. Uh, he was martyred by having his head cut off. <laughs> um, I think he threw it in the Rhone River and uh, it became a relic and at any rate. Uh, he is, uh, as you can see, a preaching saint. Uh, and uh, this particular uh, work by uh, Louisa Roland is in the Getty Museum in Los Angeles and it's um, life size, five foot nine inches high. It's made out of pine and cedar and has been polychromed. And we'll have a detail to show you that in a minute. Uh, there's this whole idea, once again, of making it so lifelike that you just believe the figure is real. Um, it's to make the saints come alive for the viewer. Uh, the eyes are glass so they will reflect light. The mouth is open as though he is preaching, as the gesture seems to suggest. What's really interesting is if you look, this is the, the bottom. You see the bottom of his feet, and uh, basically she hasn't carved an entire figure. Uh, she basically has this hollow wooden section with the draperies uh, in you know, beautiful curving carved wood uh, mounted on the, the hollow uh, wooden box, essentially. And you can see how fine uh, some of the, the details are. This beautiful hand uh, with the veining. And uh, you can see the detail here of this beautiful brocade garment. Now, this would be done in pieces. Uh, so in this case, the, the uh, hand would be pegged to the, the, the uh, framework, uh, to which is the sort of the body, uh, and very realistic uh, images. The brocade, uh, it was painted by her brother-in-law. And it's a technique, estofado, in which you put the gilding, uh, the gold leaf, all over uh, the, the area that you want to, uh, to have this texture. Uh, and then you cover it with brown paint, and then you uh, take a stylus to scrape away and incise into the paint and reveal the gold below, and uh, obviously done with the very intricate uh, forms to uh, uh, really give the, the feeling of a rich brocaded robe. There are others of these large-scale works. Uh, St. Michael defeating the, uh, the devil from uh, 1692. Uh, it is uh, speculated that her son may have done the polychroming on this one. And Christ carrying the cross, once again, we don't have an exact date, uh, 1697 to 1701, perhaps around 1700. That's a, just a general date. Um, this uh, is from the Convent of the Poor Clares, and it would be a devotional image. This kind of image would be carried in procession uh, during Holy Week. Uh, the head and the hands and the feet are carved very realistically in wood and then polychromed. Uh, in this case, there's a metal armature and then actual clothing, actual rich, rich fabrics uh, would be placed over the metal armature. So uh, almost like dressing a gigantic doll or mannequin. Um, and then of course the fabric gets changed over the centuries. People uh, create uh, new 
new garments uh, for these uh, beloved cult images. You can see the Christ features are very beautiful. They're very sensitive, uh, but he is suffering. And uh, there is the crown of, crown of thorns pressed down over his head. His eyes are lowered as he's carrying the heavy cross. Blood is dripping from his, uh, from the, from his forehead and down his neck. Um, it was believed that these cult images, these images that were often taken in procession, uh, were supposed to have the true likeness of divinity. Uh, that when the faithful look at them, they would feel like they were looking upon Christ and that they would experience Christ's suffering uh, as he walks on the way of the cross. Uh, so, you know, they would have these being carried uh, and people would uh, walk with them and uh, cry out and weep. Um, I like to call this kind of heightened realism, uh, which excites the devotion. It makes you people feel that they are really present with Christ. Um, this is a, a hallmark, you go clear back to late medieval devotion, where we call it affective piety. I know where this, it uh, affects the viewer, and uh, he is expected to shed many a tear, as uh, it, uh, Ludwig the Carthusian says in the 14th century. <laughs> so here we have the face of Christ. Um, this is a particular cult image uh, that is in, as, um, it's uh, known as La Macarena de la Esperanza. Now, Macarena is a section of Seville, and in the local church uh, is the statue. It's known as Our Lady of Hope, Nuestra Señora de la Esperanza, of de la Macarena. Uh, it's shown as the Madonna of Sorrows with uh, these crystal tears. She's weeping. She's, just, she's exquisitely beautiful. Um, one of the interesting things when I was looking for pictures of this was I found this website. Uh, most of them, of course, were in Spanish, but I found one in English which was describing exactly what goes on in the function of this, of this statue and how, uh, you know, it's been, what, since around 1700, uh, we're now past uh, 2,000 for over 300 years. This uh, statue has functioned and been in use. Um, obviously, the polychroming looks very fresh, so my guess is that it has been repolychromed, but uh, you know, I don't know that for certain. Now, once again, this is, um, I couldn't find a, a lot of details about exactly what the body is, but presumably you have some kind of armature below it, and the face and the hands are uh, carved. And then uh, it's a, a cult statue. Uh, it is uh, the focus of devotion, and it particularly is carried in the Good, uh, Good Friday procession. Uh, they have a huge procession. Um, they start off with another statue of Christ, and then it's followed uh, really like a float with uh, people carrying it, and they're hidden. Uh, beneath the draperies, and uh, they have uh, uh, candles uh, that have been lit. And uh, the, it, was, it was really interesting reading this website because they were talking about how they put up $70,000 to buy a glorious garment for uh, Nuestra Señora, for Our Lady. Um, and they, they showed this as a particular uh, note of piety and of devotion. So, you know, they, uh, they do reclothe these figures. Uh, and that was in 19, the 1970s, they were saying. That's when that was done. So here I found these pictures on the web uh, with the... Uh, the, the modern clothing uh, on the 17th century uh, figure, which we can basically see the hands and uh, the face. Um, if you think about something like Byzantine icons, uh, over time they will completely encrust uh, the whole figure around the face and the hands with jewels and uh, other things, and then of course have to, have to leave the face, uh, although it often is repainted too, uh, free, because it's, it's a cold image. And as you see, uh, she's, she's weeping. 
uh, her brows are knit, uh, very delicate, graceful hands uh, express that sorrow, strong emotional impact. One of the things that was so striking um, about was pretty much what I expected, but she was talking about the reactions of people, that they would cry out, Viva la Macarena! And the women would weep, and the men would beat their breast, and this is exactly what in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and right up to the present day, um, people are told that this is how they should react. They should uh, feel that they are in the presence of, um, of Christ and his mother and think about their sufferings. Um, in a sense, that you could, I guess you could say it's a play, um, but you know, it, they make the holy image present for the devout followers, the devout faithful. So this is rather interesting because this, this figure is still in use. One other interesting thing about this is, um, we'll be talking about Marjorie, uh, Audrey Flack later on, a 20th century art, artist. artist. Um, and she was in Spain and uh, she saw this and she said, you know, who created it? And they said, ah, oh, La Roldana. And she said, La? La? A woman artist? She had, of course, never heard of it. So she did a number of paintings of uh, this, this uh, statue by uh, Luisa Roldana, or Roldan, La Roldana. Uh, 